anything, any of those projects, then have a look at our website and um, apply. Right, so looking at the year ahead, um, I'm going to look at it by going backwards in time uh, to the 1900s, early 1900s really, um, more specifically just before at the, at the turn of the century. And the challenge that we have in looking at the year ahead and trying to predict what type of internet issues might come up, um, it's impossible. You know, no one can really say what type or what specific issues will come up. But I think we can make a pretty good guess and a pretty good understanding of the types of issues that we're likely to see in the year ahead. And so if we go back to the turn of the 20th century, um, it was a time when, as usual, human beings seemed to have some sort of wars going on all over the place. Uh, this particular war was the Americans taking on the Spanish and fighting in the Atlantic, which led to the Treaty of Paris. And the US uh, was then able to get the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Queen Victoria was at the height of her reign, in fact, towards the end of her reign. Um, the particular gown that she was wearing was purple or mauve in color. That wasn't available to everyday people. Um, the only time when purple became available as a fashion item was with the birth of the organic chemistry industry and aniline dyes. That's again in the 1890s. There was, as usual, a lot of speculative bubbles. Um, there was a lot of financial uh, dreams being sold. And perhaps not surprisingly, it was the banks that were being asked to rein in some of their foolishness. And there were plays being written about how the banks um, need to get smarter. So hopefully, you see a little bit of parallel there. And out in the countryside, um, there was peace and quiet. Uh, there was lovely cows and horses and sheep and whatever else you have in the farms. It was really quiet. Now, hopefully, you've got this mindset. And that's really important. It's about the mindset. Hopefully, you've got this mindset of peace and tranquility, a few bubbles. Uh, life was good on the farm. There was um, lots of milk. There was, you know, everyone went off to school in the morning, bunk school. But it was very peaceful life. And it, and it had always been like that for many, many years. And that was the mindset that, you know, there was, you live out in the country and you have no worries and everything's done. And then something happened. And that's disruption. So we have a mindset where society's expectations and norms and you know, what they think is normal is in that scene setting. And then technology comes along and causes a disruption. And so in the 1890s, what was normal, which was horses and carriages, was suddenly replaced by steam engines and what they call horseless carriages or self-propelled vehicles. Now, try and imagine the shock that this imposes on society. And just as you have in society, you have people who adapt very quickly. Society itself takes a very, very long time to adapt to technology changes. And those who live at the edge of technology often forget that because they're early adapters or they're early movers. They just think it's obvious. But societal norms and values take a long, long time to change. And if your mindset is horse carriages and horses, when you're confronted with disruptive change, which is what the self-propelled vehicle did, you re most of society reacts quite badly. They don't want change. Change is seen as a threat. And so if you think about the business impact that these steam engines and subsequently combustion engines had was there were about 13,000 businesses in the United States that were making horse and buggy parts. Most of them closed because all they knew was how to provide horse and buggy parts. A few of them were smart and adapted to horseless carriages. So they stopped making or reduced making, sorry, um, buggy parts and buggy whips. And um, they started looking at this new thing and how they can adapt to that. Stud Baker was the only manufacturer which successfully made the switch from horse-drawn 
to gasoline powered vehicles. And so even if you know that there's disruption, even if you know that you need to adapt, it's actually quite hard to adapt sometimes. And the funny thing, of course, is it's not often the, f the frontline manufacturers who adapt the best. So one of the examples was Timken Company, which is still around in some form, which makes roller bearings. They, they changed their thinking from they make roller bearings for wagon wheels to making roller bearings for anything that goes around pretty much. And so that's how businesses tend to adapt fairly quickly to technological impacts that come along and disrupt things. However, most of society isn't that quick to adapt. And farmers, for example, are definitely, and going back to the image of farmers being farmers forever, um, and you know they knew how to grow things, they knew how to harvest, they knew how to look after animals. And for them, change and technology changes was something that they would resist. And so they lobbied to maintain the status quo. Uh, for them, the horseless carriage was something that was completely alien and unacceptable, a threat, and therefore, as, as a group, they decided to lobby. Um, and in the United States, they were quite successful, actually. And so in Pennsylvania, in the year 1896, both houses of the state legislature unanimously passed a bill that required people driving their horseless carriages upon chance encounters with cattle or livestock need to, one, immediately stop the vehicle, two, immediately and rapidly as possible disassemble the automobile, and three, conceal the various components out of sight behind near bushes until livestock and equestrian is sufficiently pacified. So, Quaker, and particularly the Quakers uh, in Pennsylvania, their reaction to technology change was lobbying and putting into place restrictions that would maintain what they thought was normal. Meanwhile, over in the UK, uh, they had what they called the Locomotive Act of 1865, which is also known as the Red Flag Act. And the reason that it was a Red Flag Act was it required lo road locomotives to do all of this which includes one person carrying a flag and walking in front of the road locomotive. And so that was an attempt to slow down technology change until society catches up with that. And secondly, and quite interesting, and we see this even today, definitions that just don't make sense are used because we don't grasp what's actually happening. And so if you don't have a word for the automobile, they used the word road locomotive because they had a locomotive act. And if we see some of the terms that are being used today and how we tend to shape and change those and actually go quite beyond what was their intended meaning to grapple with this change that's happening. And think of the impact that it had. So the locomotive act uh, made the UK focus on railways because they impeded the development of road automobiles. And the impact of that law was that the motor car industry shifted to Germany and Austria. And it was in Germany and Austria that they figured out that motor cars are actually meant for recreational use. And so again, when we look at technology change, law, passing laws to regulate technology before they've had a chance to play out effectively moves those technologies to other areas or countries where it's allowed to flourish. And because if you try and regulate technology too early, what happens is, is we still haven't figured out how to use this technology. And today we look back and say, well, it's obvious that um, a car is for not for you know, move, moving people around in terms of their as goods, but it's for recreational use. However, if your frame of reference is the railways, then you think of cars as another form of sort of flexible railways. And this is people grappling and society grappling with technology changing much quicker than they've adapted as a society. And if I look at the year ahead, that's what I would say as the types of issues that are going to play out in the year ahead. We, we don't know specifically what they are because we know some of them are already in play and, and they'll just carry on. 
Um, and, and you know, without doubt, there'll be absolutely new issues that come around. But if you think about the issues that come, I ask you to put this perspective. What if the issues that are playing out are simply us adapting to quick technology change? And actually, it's our mindset that needs to change as quickly, but it's impossible. And that's why friction happens. So it's society taking time to adapt to rapid technology changes. And some will indeed uh, resist because they will see this dis uh, disruption as something that is alien and something that they need to stop because it isn't normal. It isn't normal from the current perspective. Some will indeed lobby to maintain the status quo. But just as farmers could not stop the change to horse discarriages, we can, all the lobbies that we have, and we see many examples of that, will at best delay the change. It certainly will not be able to stop that change. And the places where that lobby is successful, the creative and the good use of that technology will shift to other countries. They will thrive and they will adapt. And if, we, if for example, we continue to have laws that impede New Zealand's progress, it's at our expense. On the other hand, we have the opportunity to recognize that society will take time, but we can be world leaders. And there are examples of laws that are on the books today which haven't become law yet, and we would like them to become law. And if we can do that, we have an ability globally to be leaders in use of the internet for society's good. And I guess the analogy between the motor car and the internet can only go so far. And we'll hear a little bit today later on about the economic impact of the internet. And the one thing that you will take away from that is that it's hard to determine what it is because the internet is a general purpose technology, much like electricity or roads. It's really hard to determine its impact. But the impact is real, and the impact and the opportunities are very positive. However, with this change in uh, society, we have probably a developing unfortunate situation where some members of our society will continue to remain marginalized. In fact, if anything, the internet is going to deepen some of the digital divides. And therefore, the efforts that we need to make on digital inclusion will have to increase. And free markets and our love of free markets isn't going to solve that. And I think that one of the challenges that we have in the year ahead is to try and be far more inclusive, knowing that the internet is making those divides substantially bigger and more painful. Um, just to end, um, a little bit of, I suppose, update on NetHui. Uh, I think Internet NZ has hugely benefited, and I hope people have benefited from us being able to come together. It's certainly, quite, as a small organization, it is absolutely um, quite a heavy load on our resources, but the community benefit is so substantial that we are committed now that we'll have a national NetHui which will alternate between Auckland and Wellington each year. And so uh, NetHui next year, around this time, will be in Wellington. We certainly also want to have uh, go outside all Auckland and Wellington, and we'll have a mini NetHui or a regional NetHui hopefully before the end of this year or early next year in South Island. Uh, it'll be a much smaller version, and it will also try and take it to the next level of working particularly with local governments, because that seems to be a gap at the moment. But also, we also see uh, NetHui as not so much as a conference, but also as a growing community involvement in internet-related issues. And that's all I had. Um, don't think, unless somebody has any questions or comments, I think we can move on. Does anyone have any questions or comments? No? Okay, we should move on then. Thank you.